In a 10-month program completed in June 1961, the Bell Aero Systems Company, under contract to U.S. Army Transportation Research Command, has demonstrated the feasibility of controlled free flight with a rocket mounted on a man's back. Shown here in the feasibility configuration used for the 38 free flights, the rocket belt consists of a body-contoured fiberglass corset which serves as a mount for the propellant and pressurant tanks and valving. The pivot bearing, which is the attachment point for underarm rings, control arms, gas generator, manifold, and nozzles, is affixed to the main propulsion system support frame to indicate the amount of propellant remaining. Visual and audio signals were abandoned in favor of a more reliable vibratory signal applied through a bone conduction device located in the helmet. The operator receives intermittent signals beginning after 15 seconds at the rate of one per second until the 22nd point at which the vibratory signal becomes continuous. At this point, the operator terminates the flight with an adequate margin of propellant remaining. All rocket belt components, the gas generator, propellant and pressure and tanks, valving, controls, and main mounting corset were individually tested prior to system testing. A combination pressure vent valve allows the operator to pressurize the propellant tanks in preparation for flight and to vent down the tanks after the flight. Initial system tests were made in a rocket test cell with remote manually operated controls using a plaster dummy to simulate operator mass, the thrust and throttling capability of the system was established. Behind the barrier, the operator, while controlling the test operation, also developed a sense of feel for the throttle control. Later, the operator moved into the cell and positioned himself so as to prevent operation of both throttle and control stick to feel out control stick response during rocket firing. On December 29, 1960, the first manned rocket flight was attempted, using tether ropes for the operator's safety. This first introduction of man to machine illustrates well the problems of thrust control and system stability which were to be resolved in the ensuing test program. Maximum safety precautions dictated the use of a lower tether, which proved to be much too inhibiting to the operator's freedom of movement. Although liftoff and support from rocket power was brief and sporadic, a milestone was achieved, the problems were now better defined, and operator confidence increased by virtue of this first actual experience. Moving outdoors provided additional maneuvering space. As operator experience was accumulated, progress in translational flight was noted. Handling characteristics were such that the operator soon learned that a rearward fall with power off could be averted by short rocket bursts to assist his return to an upright position. The major disadvantage of outdoor operation during the winter season was the rapid condensation of the steam exhaust, which frequently obscured the vision of the operator and the observers. Four tethered flights were completed on the outdoor range prior to moving to a large hangar. The hangar flights provided fog-free operation and afforded the operator excellent visual reference during flight. As operator proficiency advanced, longer duration flights permitted a much better appraisal of control and stability problems. The squeeze throttle control, which proved to be inadequate for the precise thrust control which was desired, was replaced by a rotary control grip of the motorcycle type. Both the throttle and control stick were relocated on the upper side of the control arms for improved operator coordination. The pitch control functioned as required, but continued difficulty was encountered in trying to control the yaw. In the early flights, the gimbaled nozzles were fixed in a neutral or centered position and locked. Even the slightest misalignment of the two nozzles induced the rotation, however, and so various degrees of gimbal freedom were evaluated. Response to corrections was usually sluggish, and even with anticipatory correction on the part of the operator, the yaw was difficult to correct. Added difficulty arose from the tether, which would alternately lead and retard. Moving several feet laterally from the tether track would also tend to force the operator sideways. It was discovered that when the nozzles were parallel to the operator, the jet wake would occasionally deflect his legs and cause a pendulum effect. To correct this, the nozzles were canted outward at a five-degree angle, which directed the exhaust away from the lower extremities. 
no further difficulties were encountered with jet effects on the operator's legs. By the 20th tethered flight, high hovering at altitudes of 10 to 12 feet was demonstrated. During one such maneuver, the tether rope slackened and entangled on the throttle valve bracket with a resultant pitching of the operator. Rocket power was cut off by the operator, and he normally would have been lowered on the tether. However, the rope cut through and the operator dropped, sustaining a fracture of the kneecap, and it was necessary for him to withdraw from the test flight program. The second operator undertook a series of familiarization flights on the tether, and since a majority of system redesign had already been accomplished, as an outcome of the early flights, the learning period was not a lengthy one. The persistent problem of yaw control was overcome by the fixed nozzle installation with operator-controlled jet evaders. The addition of a fiberglass abdominal support held in position by dual safety belts further immobilized the lower trunk and increased the system's stability. The ability to hover and then translate at velocities of seven or eight miles per hour and finally hover again before touchdown was now demonstrated over pre-planned courses. During this series of tethered flights, two significant design changes were effected. The first was to add special hip padding to the corset and to increase the underarm ring padding. This reduced the tendency for torso movement and resulted in increased stability. The second and most fruitful design change was the installation of fixed nozzles with jet evaders for yaw control. These exhaust deflector rings are activated by the left hand control stick. The second operator completed a total of 36 tethered flights, after which he was adjudged to have attained a proficiency level which was adequate to undertake the task of free flight. On April 20th, 1961, the first man rocket free flight was accomplished with a point-to-point -point flight path covering a distance of 100 feet. Successive free flights demonstrated response to operator control and improved the takeoff and landing techniques. Yaw control was demonstrated by rotating through 180 degrees about a point while hovering over the touchdown point. In straight flight, the operator averaged 20 miles per hour and reached maximum speeds of 35 miles per hour. Following the straight translational flights over level terrain, several more severe challenges were offered First, ascending a hill of approximate 23 degree slope with a total rise of 30 feet in altitude. Next, traversing a 20 foot wide creek bed with water flowing in a 12 foot wide channel. And then on the third flight, descending the 30 foot high hill. In climbing and descending the hills, an effort was made to maintain a flight path parallel to the contour of the hills. Combined lateral and yaw control was effectively demonstrated by flying in a counterclockwise circular course. A temporary record of this flight path is generated by the jet wake on the tall grass. An equally successful flight was achieved in a clockwise direction. Tight and rapid maneuvering was called for in flying a slalom course, and on the first attempt, the operator experienced severe yaw and therefore terminated the flight. Taking off again, the operator did not attain sufficient altitude and stumbled while attempting a tight turn. Although this was the most severe fall experienced by this operator, neither man nor machine sustained injury or damage. Increasing the distance between flags and attainment of adequate operator altitude resulted in a most successful slalom flight path demonstration. The ability to fly over obstacles was dramatically portrayed in this flight over a fire truck, where it was necessary to apply precise vertical control. The jet exhaust was in no way harmful to the vehicle where impingement occurred. Operator proficiency and the adequacy of control are demonstrated by flying to a predetermined point, hovering, 
turning through 180 degrees and returning to the takeoff point where a second hover and turn are executed before touchdown. The success of the free flight program was amplified by the first public presentation of the Bell Rocket Belt as part of the U.S. Army Transportation Command's Project Mobility Demonstration held at Fort Eustis, Virginia from June 7th to June 10th, 1961. Military personnel, guests, and representatives of the press, radio, and television witnessed a total of six free flights during the week. Three of the six flights were over obstacles, the others were high-speed translational flights. Obstacles such as an Army two-and-a-half-ton truck and an H-21 helicopter proved to be no match for the man-rocket combination. It is interesting to note that the operator had no prior experience in flying over these particular obstacles, yet he was able to negotiate them without hesitation. In flying over the H-21 helicopter, the operator attained an altitude of approximately 25 feet. The maximum distance for a single flight during the program was 368 feet over level terrain at the Bell Aerosystems Niagara Falls facility. The feasibility of man's free and controlled flight with a rocket belt has been adequately demonstrated. Now this new dimension in mobility may be selected for tactical applications and through engineering development, the rocket belt will emerge as a practical and useful device.